Thank you very much, and, and thank you all for coming. You allayed my first fear that there might be nobody in the audience. So, first of all, that's good. Um, and in the run-up to this lecture, a lot of people have, asking me, have been asking me whether I was feeling nervous. And to be honest, there was a, a bit of anxiety there. But that began to feel better a few weeks ago when I had a conversation with my dad. And he reminded me that this was probably the only time in my life I'll get the opportunity to lecture my dad. <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> so when I was asked for the title of the lecture, I had to reflect on what the common themes were in my research and what really tied it all together. And of course, the focus on pain was obvious, as it would be for many other of my colleagues. But um, the other predominant theme that became apparent was time, covering ideas about the history of pain, prognosis, and the course of pain over time. And they're some of the things that I'm going to be talking on in this lecture. And I'm also going to talk about my career as an epidemiologist. So I thought, as a researcher, it's pertinent to start with a definition of epidemiology. So epidemiology is the study of the patterns and causes of health and diseases in communities. And one of the key things there is communities or populations, as epidemiology always studies populations or groups of people. And um, the, however, the aim and the focus of the research in the end is always to improve the health of individuals. And so that's why I've put an individual, in this case a patient, right at the centre of my presentation, because our aim is to improve the health and the care of these individuals. But in case some of you are thinking, wow, Kate's actually going to talk about an individual person and not focus on the populations, I'd just like to reassure you that this particular individual is actually made up of large amounts of populations. So, so don't worry, I'm going to stick to my focus here. Um, but to start off with, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of my, my history and how I got to be here right now. So I was born in Preston in Lancashire, and I lived there for a few years with my parents and my brother. And, um, and then after that, I moved to Birmingham. And it was in Birmingham that I went to school. At the age of 11, I went to King Edward's the Sixth Hansworth School in Birmingham. And at that school, I always enjoyed school. I had a good time. And, but at the age of 11, I was sat in a, a geography class. And the teacher told us something about the geography of um, South Africa. And she said, oh, but you don't need to know that. You only need to know that if you go and do a geography degree. And I remember sitting in the class and thinking, the geography degree? Oh, yeah, I quite fancy that. So from the age of 11, that's what my focus was, at getting to university to do a geography degree. And so at 18, I went off to Nottingham to study geography. Now, when I went, my idea was to look at physical geography. I was interested in rivers and um, coastal geomorphology and conservation and things like that. But while I was there, they offered courses in medical geography. And so towards the end of my degree, I began to focus in the geography of health and the geography of healthcare. So if you think of geography as maps, Geography of health and healthcare would map out healthcare and map out diseases. And I also did my dissertation on um, the associations between skin cancer and deprivation levels in Glasgow, which was essentially an epidemiological dissertation nested in a geography degree. So that was my initial foray into epidemiology as an undergraduate at Nottingham. And following my degree, I, I um, managed to get a job in London as a, an information assistant working in a public health department at one of the old health authorities. And I considered that my time there as, as an apprenticeship to becoming an epidemiologist. I dealt with lots of data, I produced lots of statistics, I did lots of prevalence figures, I produced all the data that was needed for planning the health services in that particular area. And while I was there, I was lucky enough to be offered the opportunity to do some modules in a Master's of Public Health at St George's Hospital Medical School. And um, it was the modules in epidemiology and statistics that I was interested in. However, when I went to speak to the module leaders about coming to go on their module, they said, well, you can't come on this module because you're not a medic. You're not a doctor. Only doctors can do epidemiology. 
And I thought, this doesn't sound, why can't doctors do epidemiology? Why can't non-medics do epidemiology? So I um, managed to persuade them that actually maybe they should give it a go and maybe a non-medic could do epidemiology. And I did it and I really enjoyed it. And at the end of the module, they took me to one side and said, actually, maybe you should consider a career in epidemiology. And so, so that's what I did. And it was then that I came to Kiel. I came as a research assistant, working in what was then the Industrial and Community Health Research Centre, and a few of you here will remember that. And that was the precursor to the department that many of you know now. And there was probably only eight to ten of us in the department at the time. It was very small. A few people dipped in and out. And while I was there, I, I did a number of different areas of research. But the main one that I focused on was um, a large-scale population survey of the epidemiology of sexual problems. Now, the work that I was doing happened to come out at the same time that Viagra hit the market. So this was also my first experience at talking at national conferences, at being in the news, at getting emails from Panorama asking me to go on, and all of things like this. So it was quite a good introduction. But also, I got my first research publications from this work. And I got my first flavour of the international status of research and, and travelling around the world, being involved in research. So my first international conference was a talk at a GP meeting in Spain. And my first international collaboration was with some Dutch colleagues, in which we did a systematic review, which was then published. And as I said, at, at that time, as working as a research assistant, I was working on a number of different projects. And I was working on um, the sexual problems, so things such as impotence. I was working on sleep apnea, so snoring. I was working on hallux valgus, which is bunions, and other things as well. And I began to look at my career and thought, I'm not sure that this is the career for me. <laughs> so I took a step back and I thought about what I wanted to do. And actually, what I did was go to the other side of the world. And I went with VSO and took a position as a volunteer epidemiologist at the Child in Need Institute near Calcutta. So this was a mother and child health unit based in a rural area just outside Calcutta. And while I was there, I was teaching the health of the local, teaching the people there how to research the health of the local population, so how to work out what their health needs were and what type of health care they needed to do. So if you see the picture on the left there, that is a research study Indian style, so not an awful lot of privacy and a rather a different situation to be in. And on the bottom right, you can see the journey to work could be a little bit different as well sometimes. So while I was there, I had a chance to reflect about what I really wanted to do with my life and what I wanted to do. And, and I decided that I really did want to do a PhD and I did want to come back and work in academia. And um, luckily enough, at that time, I got um, a message from Peter Croft asking me if I was interested in doing a PhD and running a cohort study back at Kiel. And so knowing, having worked with Peter before, I decided that this was the right move for me. And so I came back to Kiel University. When I came back, I um, was running a large cohort study called the Barnes Study. And this was a study of um, people going to see their doctor about back pain. So every time somebody went to see their doctor about back pain, we sent them an invitation to take part in our study. And then we sent them a series of questionnaires over the following year. So that was the study that I ran when I returned back to Kiel. And I'll come back to some of the results from that later. But also, I did my PhD on that study, and back in 2004, I graduated from my PhD. And I also published my first papers about back pain. So for any um, uh, budding PhD students in the room, these are the papers that resulted directly from my PhD. But then I began to think about, well, what do I really know about back pain? And so, um, being a geographer, I started to reflect on the places I'd been and the people, the things that I'd seen on my travels. And so, 
When I'd been in Alaska, I'd seen whale spines. That didn't tell me an awful lot about how to look at back pain. When I was in Italy, I'd seen dinosaur spines. Again, that didn't tell me an awful lot. And going to Bulgaria, I saw a totally culturally different attitude towards spines. But again, that didn't really help me a lot with how to study back pain. So I came a bit closer to home and started to think about what it meant to have back pain in the NHS in the UK. And um, one of the key things that um, the clinicians wanted to know was whether somebody had acute or chronic back pain because that was how guidelines were set out and that was how people's care was decided. And so the GP or the clinician would ask people how long they'd had their pain for and in the consultation they were able to um, ask the question in different ways and really decide for themselves whether they thought the person had acute or chronic back pain. But being a good researcher again, I went back to look for the definition of what chronic pain was. And so this is the definition from IASP, or the International Association for the Study of Pain. And IASP defines chronic pain as pain that persists beyond normal healing time, which may be three months or six months, depending on the situation you're looking at. So that's the international definition of what chronic pain was. I then looked at what are the research studies had defined as chronic back pain. And actually, the definitions weren't so standard. People used different definitions. Some of them um, just asked the clinician to decide whether somebody had chronic pain without giving a definition. Other studies gave a time period of, against which people had to have their pain for to be defined as chronic. And other people gave a more specific definition, so that maybe people had to be off work for more than three months to have chronic pain, or some people had to have disabling symptoms for three months. So all of this was very good, but it still didn't give me an idea of what question I should ask. So I did a, a pilot study asking people how long they'd had their pain for, and these are a selection of the types of responses you get from people when you ask a person with back pain how long they've had their pain for. And the, these, quest, these responses are absolutely fine. They can be classified into acute or chronic back pain. But when you send a questionnaire out, you also get lots of responses you don't necessarily expect. So these are the other types of responses that you get when you ask people how long they've had their pain for. And these don't really help anybody to decide whether somebody's got acute or chronic pain. But these, this is the reality of living with back pain. Many people have it all the time, constantly. They can't remember how long they've had it for. It just seems to have been forever. And so... Still, I wasn't able to come up with any definition of what chronic pain should be in a research study on back pain. But luckily, around that time, I um, became involved with a consensus study with some Dutch colleagues. And in that study, groups of experts got together and came up with some definitions of back pain episodes that could be used in research. And the definition that the group came up with for an episode of back pain was a period of pain in the lower back lasting for at least 24 hours. But importantly, it had to be preceded and followed by one month without back pain. So if somebody hadn't had a, a month without back pain for 10 years, then their episode would be defined as having lasted for 10 years. And so I um, translated this, quest, this definition into a question that could be used in research studies and then when we did our cohort study, the Barnes study that I mentioned earlier, that's the question that we used. And so I'm just going to move on to some of the findings that we got from that. So when we asked that question, how long people had had their pain for, what we found was that um, the majority of people had had their pain for a long time. So this is people going to see their GP with back pain. And actually no more than a third would ever be defined as having acute pain, and much less than that if you use the shorter time definition. And almost a third of people had their pain for more than three years, which is, is, is definitely longer than the definitions that are used. And so this, this made me think, well, there's, there's more going on than this. This isn't just about acute and chronic pain. So we began to look a little bit further at this. And so this graph, you can see... Um, the bars in the paler colours are the shorter duration, so the bar in white is, is people who have had their pain for less than three months, and as you go across, the darker bars are people who have had their pain for longer periods of time. And so the graph on the left is graph of pain intensity, and what you can see is that 
people who've had their pain for less than uh, the shorter periods of time, three months or six months, they've got the lower levels of pain intensity, whereas people who've had their pain for a long time are much more likely to have higher levels of pain intensity. And the graph on the right, similarly, if you look at disability, you can see similarly that people who've had their pain for short periods of time have got lower levels of disability, and those who've had their pain for a long time have got higher levels of disability. And nobody had ever shown anything like this before, because people had only ever thought about back pain as being either acute or chronic, and not actually looked at how long people had had their pain for. But we also began to look at other things apart from the pain and the disability. And um, here's an example of some psychological symptoms. So again, the graphs are similar. The white bars are the people with lower, um, shorter duration of pain, and the dark bars are people with longer duration of pain. And you can see that, um, again, people with, who'd had their pain for shorter periods of time had lower levels of anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms, whereas those who'd had their pain for longer were more likely to be anxious or have symptoms of depression. So again, this, this, this was a new finding, and, and it really just emphasised that the, the division that was used in clinical practice of acute and chronic back pain based on three months or more actually wasn't very useful and wasn't telling the clinician an awful lot about people's back pain. So that's a little bit of information about what people's pain history is, and I'm going to move on to talking about what happens after they've been to the doctor with back pain. So I'm going to be talking about pain trajectories. So a trajectory is a pattern of pain over time, how a person's pain or a group of people's pain changes over a period of time. So um, in this graph, you can see up the side is, is pain intensity, and that's scaled from 0 to 10. So people are asked to scale their pain from 0, which means no pain, to 10, which is pain as bad as it can be. And along the bottom is time. So we start on the left with um, the baseline. That's when people consulted their GP, and then it goes up to six months later. And this graph just shows the average pain that people experienced over time. And you can see that, on average, at baseline, the pain level was about 4.5 out of 10. And by six months later, the average pain went down to about 3 out of 10, which is useful and interesting, but it doesn't tell us an awful lot. And when you talk to clinicians and you talk to patients, they, don't, they say their pain changes. It goes up and down. And, and actually, this doesn't show that at all. So when you look at a graph with all the individuals in, this is what it looks like. And actually, this doesn't tell you anything at all either because you can't make head nor tail of who's doing what and what actually the picture is. So then we had to devise a way of actually finding out whether there were any distinct patterns within this mess of data. So I worked with um, statistical colleagues here, and we used a, a technique called longitudinal latent class analysis. And this is an, a technique that hasn't previously been used in any musculoskeletal condition. And what that did was group people into um, clusters who have different patterns of pain over time or different trajectories. So in this graph, you can see there's a, a green line at the bottom, and that's people that we classified as having recovering pain. So when they went to the GP, they had relatively high levels of pain, and then um, that calmed down very quickly. And within a couple of months, they had little or no pain for the following six months. The line above that is in black, and that's what we call persistent mild pain. So they're people who had pain that persisted constantly throughout the six months, but wasn't at a high level, that was sort of grumbling pain that just carried on. There's also a group of people in the blue line that we called fluctuating pain. Now, the line doesn't show this very well, but these are people whose pain shoots up and down all the time and never has a level that it settles to. And at the top is people who we defined as having severe chronic pain. So these are people who had high levels of pain all the time, that never, their pain never got better. So I just want to show you how these um, summary clusters look when you look at the individual people. So 
These are four graphs that show the four clusters that you've just seen. And you can see quite clearly that the clusters do actually represent people who have different patterns of pain over time. So if you look at the top left, you can see people who um, they do have pain throughout the six-month period, but it doesn't go above a 5 out of 10, and most of the time it, it's at fairly low levels. Whereas if you look at the graph at the top right, those are people who've got severe chronic pain. So their pain is always above a 5 out of 10 for the whole period that we're looking, them at, looking at them. And similarly, the two graphs at the bottom show the recovering group who have very low levels of pain, often no pain during the follow-up period, and then the fluctuating group, which really is all over the place, and these are people whose pain varies wildly from very low levels to very high levels. But that's actually the smallest group and of, of, of the pain clusters. So that's a little bit about the back pain trajectories, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll come back to that again. But my work on uh, the, those trajectories led to me obtaining the fellowship from the Wellcome Trust that was mentioned earlier. And as part of that fellowship, I was able to go to Seattle for six months to work with researchers over there who were experts in looking at um, research in pain and in primary care. So while I was there, I did a study looking at opioid medications for chronic pain and the association with overdose. And this study showed for the first time a link between um, people who were being prescribed opioid medications for their chronic pain and having overdoses. And this paper was um, very important in, in the United States and it has actually led to changes in the guidelines for treating chronic pain and the use of opioids in those people. And this was the first paper that I got published in a large, important general medical journal. <coughs> While I was there, I also... Um, took the opportunity to collaborate with colleagues at the University of Washington and they had a large cohort study of adolescents that they'd collected data on and I was able to um, again with the statistical colleagues to uh, find trajectories of pain within those groups and if you look at the graph at the top left that's the graph of back pain and you can see whereas the lines in the graphs of adults looked fairly flat the lines in the graphs of adolescents actually look all over the place and you can really see patterns of change there and the other three graphs there are the other pains that they that we looked at in that study and these are facial pain headache and stomach pain and you can see actually the patterns in those graphs look very similar to each other which gives the first indication that our findings from back pain can actually be used across other different pain sites. And while I was over in Seattle, I also had more chance to reflect on um, the study of back pain and um, how we study back pain. And um, some people were saying at the time that maybe we knew all we needed to know about the epidemiology of back pain and maybe we didn't need to do any more. And, and I started to look elsewhere from other conditions and other research methods, and I came across life course epidemiology. And this is um, a type of epidemiology that looks across people's whole life course for influences on their health. And so it may be that factors in very early life or childhood influence your chances of getting a health condition in later life, or maybe your chance of recovering from a particular condition in later life. And so I wrote this um, paper on how to apply life course methods to back pain. And this was the first paper that I'd actually published as a solo author, as a, as a published completely on my own. So following that, I came back to the UK and um, I did some long-term follow-ups of our um, the cohort that I mentioned earlier, the Barnes study. And we followed these people up seven years after they first went to the GP. And we collected data each month again, and we constructed trajectories once again using the same method. And what we found was that trajectories looked almost exactly the same as they did in the first um, period of study. And actually what we found is that most people stay in the same trajectory over time. So the people who had the severe chronic pain in the first period of study still had severe chronic pain seven years later. Now, some people changed between the groups, but the majority of people stayed in the same trajectory. 
So that gave some inkling of the uh, potential stability of pain over time, even though an individual's may fluctuate slightly. Actually, if you've got pain that's quite bad, you still might have pain that's bad seven years later. But just to check that this wasn't just a finding from this one cohort, we also followed up another cohort that was collected here at Keel five years after the baseline. And again, you can see that the graph is very, very similar. And there's still these four clusters that we identified of people with different trajectories of pain over time. So from that, I've talked about the history of pain and I've talked about the course of pain or trajectories. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about prognosis. So prognosis is the risk of future health outcomes in people with a particular disease or a health condition. And um, so if you go to the doctor with a disease, a prognosis would be how likely you are to have recovered at a later time point. And within prognosis, we also think about prognostic factors, which are factors which um, change your likelihood of having a good or a poor outcome at a later time point. And um, it was using the information about prognosis from the studies that we'd done at Kiel and from other studies that led us to developing um, the programme of work called Start Back that some of you may be familiar with. So first of all, what we did was um, develop a, a, what's called the Start Back screening tool. And this is a, a set of nine questions um, all about prognostic factors that help determine whether people have a low risk of having um, a long-term problem, they have a, a medium risk, or they may have a high risk of having long-term pain condition. And so we developed this tool, and then um, I supervised a PhD student to um, validate and refine and test the tool, and that was the first student that I supervised to completion. And so the Start Back tool was published, and it led on to a randomised control trial where we, led, where, where we tested the approach of this stratifying into low, medium, and high risk and linking it with treatment. And what we found was that using this stratified approach to healthcare was better than the normal approach to healthcare that clinicians used in everyday practice. And actually, um, this approach using Start Back was the first time anybody had ever done this kind of approach in back pain. And it has led to big changes in the way that back pain is treated in many settings. And the Start Back approach is now used in many settings in the UK and around the world and, and has really made a difference in the way that we consider the treatment of back pain. And so that, that's all based on um, prognostic factors. So... I've talked about what I have done a lot of my research on. I'm also just going to mention a few things about my future plans. And again, I'm going to stick to um, saying something about trajectories and about prognosis, but also reflecting on the work that I'd done, showing that trajectories were fairly stable over time, um, and the work that I'd done in Seattle, showing that trajectories in adolescence were actually quite unstable and quite different and the work from the life course studies, I decided to, to look at children and start to understand what's happening in children. But first of all, to the trajectories. So you've seen the trajectories work that we did, and um, it, it, it's really important work. It shows that um, there are clusters of people with different patterns of pain, but it's not applicable to clinical practice because you have to collect repeated measures over a number of months, and it's just not feasible. So what I did was... Um, create a new question that asked patients to put themselves into a trajectory and tell us which trajectory they're actually in. And we had no idea whether patients would actually be able to do this. But when we sent it out to um, people in our studies, we actually found that people could put themselves in a trajectory. They could tell you what their back pain looked like over time. And actually what they tell you is very strongly related to their pain intensity, which is the graph here on the right, and is very strongly related to a number of other different prognostic factors. So um, this, is, this work's still ongoing, and we're still um, looking at how this question can be used, but this is a different way of classifying people's course of pain over time that may have some usefulness in clinical practice to actually understand what people's pain looks like. 
And um, as I said, I'm beginning to look at studies in children. Now, um, there's been a lot of research in back pain in adults, but actually there hasn't been that much in children. There are studies in very specific groups of children going to pain clinics, and there are some studies in the general population, but in primary care there is almost no work about pain in children. And so there's all sorts of questions that we're hoping to ask. So we want to understand whether it's possible that chronic pain actually begins in childhood or the factors in childhood that influence whether people have chronic pain later in life. We don't really know what musculoskeletal problems children go to the doctor about and why they go to the doctor. We don't know how many of them get better. We don't know who gets better and why. And we don't know who needs treatments and what treatments they need. So these are a whole batch of questions that in the coming years, I'm hoping to begin to get some answers to. And um, the latest research study that's been funded to do is um, a study where we're hoping to identify children and adolescents who go to their GP about musculoskeletal pain. So this study will hopefully start later this year. It's just, we've just received funding for it. And back to prognosis, I mentioned that we're going to look at prognosis. So you may remember that, as well as looking at back pain, I've also looked at trajectories and prognosis in some other pain conditions. And actually, um, this is uh, work that's been done here and collaborative work that I've done. And what we've shown is that actually the prognostic approach to looking at chronic pain can be used in a range of different pain conditions. We've tested it out in back pain, in headache, in facial pain, in knee pain and in widespread pain and other pain conditions. And we've shown that actually the same approach does work across different pain conditions. And this leads into a study that's ongoing at the moment where we're trying to broaden out the start back approach that we talked about earlier. And we're trying to develop a, 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 a test a new tool to see whether we can actually provide stratified care for people with all different types of musculoskeletal pain conditions. So we've just recruited 1,800 people to our cohort and we're following them up at the moment. So that work's ongoing and that will lead to a clinical trial in the next few years. So that's the research that I've done and the research I'm doing. Um, just going back to where I started with a bit more about family life, four years ago, um, things changed a little bit for me. I had a child and since then, I had a year of maternity leave, and I've been working part-time for the last four years. So actually, being promoted to professor while working part-time is one of my proudest achievements. But this represents the swinging in between the work life and personal life, and that, that's me and my son. And those eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that I had an alternative title to my talk at the beginning. And you've seen the work that I did in the beginning on sexual problems, and I've also talked about the work about opioid drugs for chronic pain, but I was never quite able to fit rock and roll into my uh, research. But then I was talking to my son, and um, he, I, I said, what do you think mommy does at work? And he looked at me very carefully, and he considered his, his answer, and he said, mommy does a boogie boogie dance. <laughs> So I thought, well, there you go. I don't need to fit rock and roll in. It's already there. So that's it. Thank you very much to all my colleagues and collaborators and friends and to my family. <laughs>